The next chapter we're going to talk about is data, which is a very, very fundamental kind of concept. And in fact, it is our innermost, most fundamental concept as we talk about closure from the inside out. And it's something that we've kind of gotten away from as programmers, ironically enough, because we dress up our data in so many different accoutrements that we lose the sight that that's actually the most important thing that we're dealing with at any given time. And so let's talk a little bit about data and build up from there what we're going to uh, eventually build into Clojure. Uh, there are a lot of different data representations out in the world. A really, really popular one that I'm sure you're all intimately familiar with is XML, uh, which was created because it was relatively easy to parse and it had some lineage with SGML and other various reasons. But now, of course, it's eating the world and we live with this way too much and it's very noisy and end users hate it. And uh, just in general, it's kind of a, a noxious thing to have to deal with on a regular basis. So we've largely kind of deprecated that in the modern world for something that's much much, much prettier, which is JSON. It's a much less formality, a lot less noisy characters and other stuff like that, and relatively easy to parse. Uh, but there's some problems with JSON in that it's not at all obvious uh, what some things are. So here's a trivial example. Uh, is this actually a string or a number? But there are other examples, too, that cause you some headaches. Yeah, so you can get into uh, problems. If you've done JSON for a while, you end up finding a situation. The first one you normally hit is, you know, timestamps. Right? You're going to talk about instance in time, which is a fundamental concept in systems of record. And yet, in JSON, you have to model that as a string. And so what ends up happening is you have a piece of data, and there aren't any schemas in JSON, so there's nothing that's going to tell you. Um, when I see this string of characters, I'm supposed to interpret it as a date. Of course, you could write a program that says, you know, when things look like they might be a date, try to parse them as a date. But that's a very um, sort of catch-as-catch-can <laughs> approach to data integrity. So, so JSON has is, is got a nice um, set of types at the bottom, but it's insufficient. Yep. So what we're going to talk about here is something called EDEN, E-D-N, which is Extensible Data Notation. Um, and so here is a person represented in Eden. And on first glance, it looks a bit like JSON in that it uses some of the same kind of primitives to build things up. But there are some real key differences between uh, Eden and JSON. And we're going to drill into a few of those. So let's talk about uh, Eden as a thing unto itself. Uh, Eden is basically a subset of the closure syntax itself. So this is the beginning building blocks of the closure language itself is this data notation called Eden. Uh, it's used as a data transfer format in uh, Datomic and some other tools, um, as well as being a syntax, of course, uh, the core syntax of closure. But it is designed to be language and implementation neutral. So you can have, uh, Eden can be read or written by any variety of languages and tools. Um, but it's not like a lot of other data formats that we have, like XML, in that it's really a system for the conveyance of values. And just values, not a lot of extra metadata about those values. And not references. I mean, one of the things you get into, I don't know, how many people remember SOAP Section 5 back in the day? So when XML and web services were first taking off, um, there was this sort of notion of trying to represent object graphs and references and identities and sort of send that across the wire. And this is one of those um, you know, Goldilocks type things. There's too much and too little and just right. And trying to put that level of semantics uh, into your notation at the bottom um, uh, we think is a bad idea. So the focus here is on values. So Eden is not a type system. You don't see any types or anything like that here. It is also not schema based. There is no schema document that comes along with Eden or something like that. It is just a system for representing objects as values and, and several different kinds of core data structures that you encounter uh, commonly, certainly in Lisp, but in other applications as well. Yes, question. So uh, how do we uh, perform some calculation? How do we know if it's a string? If we don't know whether it's a string or a number, how can we perform some calculation? Well, we'll uh, so his question is how do we know some things about it if there's not a schema? We'll look at the structure of Eden, and you can see that there are, so, there are some things in there that let you know what kind of value something is. So it doesn't have a schema, but it does have a grammar. Right. right? It does have a way of saying, you know, when I see this token, I can decide what it is. Yep. That's an important distinction. Uh, a schema, but uh, a grammar, but no schema. 
So it's a set of definitions for acceptable elements in, uh, in a textual format. Uh, there is no enclosing top element like in XML and other kinds of nested data structures, so it can be very flat. Uh, it has uh, all the common data structures that you commonly need to uh, carry on operations like lists and, and uh, sets, etc. Uh, there's a rich set of built-in uh, types in its grammar, but it also has a really nice extension model so that other people can extend it in ways that Eden uh, didn't anticipate or doesn't want to add to the core, but they can add tags to extend it in various ways and implement readers to be able to consume and produce serialized data that looks like uh, some sort of specific format that you want. And it's safe to interpret these in your mind as you're looking at these bullet points. Every one of them ends up being some reason we couldn't use XML or JSON, right? That, 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 that sort of marked out the other common choices because one of these characteristics was not available or, or implemented in an unsatisfactory way for our purposes. So let's look at the syntax of Eden. It's actually a very simple syntax. There's a web page. I showed you a web page uh, that uh, lays out all the details of uh, Eden. Uh, the scalars in Eden, there's a uh, null or nothing type, which is uh, nil, and that's nil or null or nothing, depending on which language you come from. We have primitives as booleans, which have values of true and false. Uh, we have strings, which are enclosed in double quotes and can span multiple lines, and the common escape characters like new line and tab and uh, carriage return are supported. Um, we also have characters which follow the Java convention of characters with a, a, a slash and the character name. There are also some constant characters like new line, et cetera, as you would expect. Uh, other scalars, we have integers, which are the numbers, uh, any numbers, digits one, zero through nine. And of course, we support negative numbers as well. And we have floating point numbers, which are 64-bit IEEE double precision floating point numbers, as you would expect as well. There are a couple of different ways to name things. Uh, one of them is a symbol. And if you're from a language like Ruby, you're probably familiar with the eye of the concept of a symbol. Uh, it's, a, it's a string that's used to represent something, you know, typically an identifier. Uh, and it should map to something other than just strings. It is a symbolic name for something. And it can include names space prefixes. That's one of the features of the closure language itself uses namespaces pretty heavily to partition functionality into separate logical units of work. Uh, but Eden can use namespaces as well to partition things into logical units. Um, you can think of namespaces uh, sort of like package names in Java as, as providing a consistent namespace for a grouping of like things. So closely related symbols are keywords, which are identifiers that designate themselves, or like values in enumeration. Um, they uh, typically start with a colon, and this follows the conventions of languages like Ruby as well. Uh, these are used a lot for things like uh, set keys, or, or map keys, and other sorts of um, things where you'd use intern constant strings. We also have collection types in, uh, or collections in uh, Eden. Uh, we have lists, which are a sequence of values with zero more elements within parentheses, and these can be heterogeneous, so they don't have to all be the same uh, kind of thing. So you can see there we have mixed variables and the numbers. We can also have vectors, uh, which is a sequence of values that supports random access, and that's zero or more elements within square braces. So while both of these designate a list kind, there are slightly different semantics uh, when we get into code as to how these actually operate in code. We also have uh, maps and sets. Uh, maps are a collection of key value associations. Every key should appear only once. Uh, these are unordered, and uh, they are zero or more elements within curly braces like this. Uh, you see, uh, so uh, A and 1 is a name value pair. These are separated by commas, but the commas actually are just white space. So you can put them in there if you like, or you can leave them out if you like, depending on which you think is more readable or not. Some people put commas. Some people stack them up in columns to make things more readable. So one of the things that's interesting about this, and, and Neil made the point and I want to underline it, is that we talked earlier about building out of simple things and being able to compose them. Everything nests, right? Anything can be put anywhere. So you're not going to have you know, a situation where you're like, oh, I use the red Lego brick, but there's a special rule that says you can't put that on top of a yellow uh, Lego brick. They really do feel like you know, all these parts can fit together. That being said, it would be very unusual to have a map that had a vector, the vector one, two, three, as a key in the map, which is what you see right here. But there's nothing in the language in, in Eden that says you know, what the rules are about how you're going to compose these things. That's left up to you. 
So which one is the key and which one is the value? In the, the first one is the key and the second is the value. Mm -hmm. So a, a, the keyword A points to one, the string foo points to the keyword bar, the, the vector one, two, three uh, points to the symbol four. And that and is a very unusual kind of data yes. structure. But it does show how heterogeneous it is. Uh, and of course, we have sets as well, collections of unique values, unordered, heterogeneous, zero or more elements within a pound sign and curly braces. And what does the semicolon uh, tell? Uh, is it a specific thing? There's uh, a colon. Are you talking about the colon? The colon, it's, uh, the colon is the thing that says to the grammar, this thing that follows is a keyword. So A is a keyword, but four is a symbol. So we're going to continue to explore throughout the day the ramifications of having not one, but two types that represent names. So Java has zero types that represent names. Right? If you want to use a name, you have to use a string because there is no type that represents names. Uh, the Ruby language, for those who are familiar with that, has one type that represents names, and it has keywords. It, uh, they're called symbols, but they look like uh, closure keywords. They start with a colon as, as a way of saying this thing represents a name. Uh, closure has two types that represent names, and that's very important, being able to have some flexibility. And, and as Neil already said, the, the big surface difference is that keywords name themselves. Right? They're not, they are not uh, the name that is then going to be used to point to something else. Symbols are names that may be interpreted as referring to something else, as, as uh, implying a lookup of something else. Uh, I mentioned before one of the really important characteristics of Eden, because uh, we've seen Eden now, so it's a very, very small subset of things. Uh, to make this really useful in the real world, uh, you have to have extensibility and the ability to be able to add more things onto it. Uh, and so there's an extensibility feature of Eden with uh, tagged elements, which are elements that start with a pound sign, and they affect the semantics of the following element. So you can define custom tags, and they will affect whatever the following element is and do something with it, whatever you want to do as the designer of that extension. You get to decide what the semantics of what that, that, that tag does. Uh, but this gives you the ability to do custom tag handlers, and these guys can be recursively defined. So they can be defined in terms of themselves and, uh, and nest. There are some built-in tagged elements already for common kinds of elements. One of them is one that Stu talked about specifically, which is an instant of time, which is the RFC 3339 format, which is, I guess, the, the date time format for uh, RFC. Or one of them. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's like one, one six of hours of research to figure out what you're supposed to do <laughs> when doing that kind of but stuff. But this is a really good example of a, something that you would extend Eden with because you commonly need something like time, and you can extend that and say, well, now I understand what this, this format is, and you don't have to do parsing and other kinds of silly things. Uh, there's also a built-in tag for UUID uh, to get a unique string. So that, that comes in really handy for... Uh, things like REST and integration and stuff like that. So space is the assignment operator, kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, space is just a rule in the grammar. So here, this, the grammar would say, something that has a pound in front of it is a name, followed by white space, followed by the thing that's going to be interpreted according to that name. And a, a key aspect of this, I mean, lots of things have extensibility mechanisms. Right? Just throwing spaghetti on the wall to see if it sticks. I could say, look, there's an extensibility mechanism. There's a function that gets called when you do this. But it needs to be more careful than that. So the extensibility mechanism here, um, and maybe I'm not jumping ahead on the slides, is defined in terms of the underlying types. So when you extend, you're not handed a stream of characters to process. It could work that way, but that would be a total pain in the butt, right? Because if I handed you a string of characters, if you said, I want to implement the extension mechanism, you're going to get a string of characters to process it. Well, I don't want to have to parse a stream of characters, right? We already have these underlying types, maps and sets and vectors. And so you're going to be handed a string because that's what this ends up being, right? The thing that followed inst. But if the thing that followed inst was a vector, if we had, and you could have, right? We could have said an inst is a vector that has a, an integer that is the year and an integer that is the month and, and so forth. Um, in fact, we could go back later and say that inst recognizes that, right? That the inst tag handler can, can see the thing after it as a vector, which is interpreted as a set of numbers that represent a date. But the person who's writing those tag handlers does not have to know the underlying parsing mechanism. They're already handed data structures because it's built recursively on top of those data structures. So you're, you're not, in like JSON, you're not pulling apart strings trying to figure out you know, what the, the constituent pieces are. The other really important piece of this is that what happens if you don't know how to handle these things? 
right? So let's say that I made up a type pound person. It's a nice data object. Uh, so pound person, and then that interprets a map. And in my program, I interpret that map, and then I make a Java bean out of that map. But then I send it to you, and you're a PHP application. And you don't know anything about any of the stuff that I'm doing. Uh, an EDN reader has to be able to pass through things it doesn't understand. Right? So it would say, oh, look, I saw this thing, person, that has a map in it. I just sort of put a bag around that that says, look, this is a tag thing that I don't have a processor for the tag for, and then I can hand it on to consumers. Which means that intermediate nodes in a processing network don't have to understand any additional semantics that you've chosen to layer on, because it's going to be defined recursively in terms of something it can understand. Right? It, can, it can drill through layers down to something, oh, at the bottom it's going to be vectors and lists and strings and so forth. So the other uh, piece of Eden we'll talk about are things like comments and be able to knock pieces out of it. Uh, the semicolon is the comment operator here. That's also common in Clojure as well. But there's a really interesting advantage that we have because Eden has a very regular syntax, because it uses parens and uh, vector brackets and things like that very consistently. Every one of those is a form. And so there's a disregard tag that says, disregard the next element, whatever that happens to be, what that form happens to be. So that could be a string or a vector, or it could be anything that Eden understands. Uh, that's a really powerful thing, because it allows you to selectively say, well, just ignore the next thing without having to do any kind of wild commenting kind of delineation around it. And really, you could read the comment as disregard to end of line, and the pound underscore as disregard to end of form. And the end of form, it, it's shown here being useful in something where there's more stuff on the line that you don't want to ignore. But the other case where it's really handy is when you have a huge multi-line thing you want to turn off. And you don't want to go find where the other end of it is. You just want to say pound underscore, I want to ignore that mm -hmm. thing right now. So how do we know what is the end of the comment? Or well, the end of this, this one is end of line. And this one is defined recursively, again, in terms of all the other things. So if pound underscore, if the thing after that is a square bracket, it's going to be a vector that we have to ignore. So the parser goes and finds the, the close square bracket. But you don't have to be in the business as the person typing pound underscore or worrying about that. You just know, I'm going to get rid of that thing. Um, and because we're going to later use this to build programs, it's extremely useful when commenting out a single element of a program that you want to disregard for some reason to not have to go and find and shape things. I mean, if you had to go and find and shape things like that, you might get in a situation where you had to use an IDE to develop code because you couldn't just work in a text editor. And that would really stink. Uh, last thing I'll talk about Eden, and this is actually cooked in at a really, really low level, uh, at the Eden level, not in the closure level, is this, this concept of equality. And it's a really important thing because equality is a really slippery concept on places like the JVM, particularly when you have mutable data and things like inheritance, and there's all sorts of issues around that. Uh, but equality is pretty straightforward here. Uh, uh, all the scalars uh, are equal to values of the same type and the same Eden representation. That's not surprising. Uh, integers and floating points are considered equal to values only of the same magnitude, type, and precision. Also not surprising at all. Um, sequences and lists and vectors are equal to other sequences who count as the same and that each corresponding pair of elements by ordinal is equal. So we're checking values against these guys to see if they're equal or not. Uh, sets are equal if they have the same kind of elements, and for every element in one set, an equal element in the other. So, well, of course, order doesn't matter in sets. And maps are equal if they have the same number of entries, and for every key value entry in one map, an equal key is present and mapped to an equal value in the other. So, it makes sense. There's no uh, trickiness there. And then tag elements have to have define their own equality semantics. There's no way Eden could possibly know what you're going to do if you do a tag extension. And so, part of what they need to do is to define their own quality semantics so you can check to see if they're equal or not. The effect of these rules is that after you use Eden for a while, you become incapable of writing correct Java programs because you never remember to implement hash code and equals because why would any language make you do something like that? <laughs> But it's nice that this is defined at, at such fundamental level. But notice that uh, equality problem is generally much easier in closure because so much emphasis is placed on immutability in the language, not mutability. And we'll dig way more into that as we keep going. Uh, that's all we have, actually, on the core piece of data in Eden. Uh, we'll move on and start converting data into code next.